So today I'll be talking about some of the work using self-supervised deep learning to understand big biological image data sets. Oh, is, there, is this okay? Good, perfect, okay. Um, so here is what I have for you. To, oh, sorry, can I just turn us to the preventive view from my notes? Okay, so here is my outline for you today. So I'll start by introducing you to big image data and um, its promises. And we talk about representations, which are how people automate analyses on this data set. And then I'll introduce challenges in pre existing methods for analyzing big image data before moving on to um, some of the work that we've been developing using self supervised learning for analyzing big image data, which overcomes these challenges. And then finally, I'll give you some examples of the ways that we've been applying insights extracted from our methods. But to begin with, this is what my data looks like. So these are high clotted screens, and they collect images of proteins for most of the proteome for various organisms. So these students try to collect systematic data for as many proteins as they can. So each protein is tagged with a fluorescent marker, which is by convention shown as green in these images. So the green in these images shows the localization and expression of um, a particular protein. And then normally, these images will repeat this data collection process um, over various conditions to assess how proteins change in response to drug treatments or mutation or between different cancer cell lines. So, not only do these images try to image as many proteins as they can, but also an image is collected without any prior knowledge of whether a condition will affect the protein or not. So the goal of the screen then is to enable um, exploratory analysis and hypothesis testing, because we expect that novel insects will be buried somewhere within this mass of systematic and unbiased data. So to give you an example of what's possible with these data sets, this is just one of the images from the human protein analysis, and it shows the well studied um, tumor protein, P53, in skin cancer cells. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with this protein. So P53 is localized to the nucleoplasm, and it's variable between single cells. So um, um, it, the expression of this protein varies from, um, from cell to cell based upon cell cycle search. So, one question you might be able to ask with the study set is well, which of the 12,000 proteins in the study set are most similar? To that of P53. And um, you will probably find other proteins that aren't in the nucleoplasm and are variable based upon cell cycle. And maybe you will discover some new cell cycle regulated um, transcription factors that way. And hopefully, you can see what makes answering these questions hard. The data sets are very large. So, for example, if you wanted to find all of the proteins similar to P53, you would have to look through 80,000 images and compare each of these images to this image. So doing this manually is not going to scale, and it's way too subjective as well. And this problem forms the core of my research. How do we extract insects from these screens? So in order for us to enable computational analyses on these images, um, we're going to need to use something called a representation. And representations are comprised of features, which are quantitative measurements taken from the image. So I have a feature representation here, and it's shown as a heat map. So you can think of each of these columns as a number, OK? And features are pretty general, but to give you some concrete examples of features you might use, you may, one of these features might measure the size of a cell or the brightness of a fluorescent pattern. So typically, you will have a whole set of these measurements. So the entire set of measurements forms a unified representation of the biology inside of the, of the image. So representations are nice because they enable a wide um, range of downstream computational analyses. So we have a representation for each image of a protein, right? So um, because these representations are quantitative, you can think of them as being a data point in some kind of a high dimensional space. So this representation space actually enables a lot of analyses. So for example, answering what proteins are similar, that's just as simple as just taking piece of three and looking at what proteins are neighboring it inside of the space. Similarly, if you want to automate um, labeling processes, that's as simple as drawing boundaries in the space to form classifiers. But the one thing to emphasize is that our ability to do these analyses really depends upon the quality of the representation. So if you had a representation that looked like this, that didn't really put biologically similar proteins together, if you tried looking for neighbors, you'd imagine we wouldn't really get really relevant really, really answers, right? So getting a representation that looks more like this is actually a very hard problem. And to consider why, look at these two images, all right? So these are proteins that both localized to the nucleus of cells and they're both brightly expressed. So these proteins are actually very similar and in a representation space, they should be pretty close together. But there are aspects of the image that are irrelevant to protein biology, such as the proliferation of the cells or the shape and size of the cells that are different between the image and that can distract from our measurements of protein biology. 
So if you don't design the features, what happens is, is that you may accidentally group images by the number of cells or like um, the size of the cells. So your similar representation may be because of those instead of protein biology, which is the thing that you want to study. So the question then comes, how do we obtain a good representation that actually represents um, protein biology and that's useful for um, our analysis of protein biology though? So this is a core problem. So classically, researchers have um, solved this through extensive engineering. So this is a schematic of a feature um, representation method that a previous student in our lab came up with. And like many classical methods, it relies upon a lot of pre-processing steps. And then the end point is that you have features that are carefully designed by an expert that capture more biology over nuisance value. And methods like this usually result in very good representations. But the limitation is, is that obviously the process of coming up with a method like this um, is laborious and requires a lot of time and expertise, right? So expertise not computational, and only computational because you have to code all of this, but also biological because you have to think of the features that's going to capture biology and not um, nuisance variation them. But because these work methods usually need to be very specific in order to work well, they often aren't very generalizable. So when confronted with new data sets, some of the hard-coded assumptions in this whole pipeline may fail, and that would cause the entire pipeline to fail them. So to get around this, what researchers have to do is, is that they have to come up with new features and a new pre-processing pipeline every single time they have a data set for a question. So this is a schematic of another um, method that is designed for human cells. And you can see it uses very different features than the previous method. So it has elaborate features that correlate the location of protein granules of microtubule. And um, while the features of this method are important, um, my concern is, is, is that like, these processes really bottleneck the analysis of microscopy data sets. Usually coming up with a method like this will take months, if not years, right? But meanwhile, our data collection processes are becoming so efficient that you can collect tens of thousands of images in a single day. And any of those images may challenge your pre-existing pipeline. So what I'm interested in understanding in, in, with my research done is how machine learning can help us break out of this bottleneck. Can machine learning automatically design representations for us? So the first thing I want to talk about in respect to answering this question are convolutional neural networks used for deep learning. So deep learning obviously has become very famous in recent years for its performance. But I think one subtlety that often goes overlooked is, is that the reason they perform so well is, is that they automatically learn what features that they need to extract from your data in order to solve training problems that you've given them. So the features that they've learned can, can be more sensitive and more robust to nuisance variation than those designed by bioimaging experts. So you can see that this is um, the representation learned by a deep learning method, and this is the representation learned by a classic, like, from a classic method, okay? And you can see that the representation learned by the deep learning method separates the, the biology, the different colors, um, a lot more than that of the classic method. So I think a natural question for us to form understanding that is, is that well, can we use deep learning to automatically design representations for us? And the thing that really limits this approach is, is, is that a representation learned by a model really depends upon the training problem, since it's extracting information to solve that specific problem, right? So what people have observed is that to learn good representations, you often need a lot of manually labeled training data for the biology that you want to study. And to give you a sense of the scale of data you have to collect, um, you have to label anywhere from tens of thousands to millions of images, right? So over here, I have a table of how different um, representations learn do or classify the type of the drug an image of, of breast cancer cells have been, have been treated with. So while well, you can see that a deep learning method that has been treated that has been trained with a lot of labeled data that's better than that of a classic engineered method. Methods that use deep learning but don't use um, labeled data don't seem to do quite as well. So well, this is a different approach to the problem, obviously. It doesn't resolve the bottleneck for me. You may not need to spend a lot of time manually, manually designing features anymore, but now you need to label thousands or millions of images. So that doesn't quite seem like you no know, a time saving for me. So this is the problem that I'm going to address today then. Can you find a way to get our models to learn good representations that are useful for, bio, for understanding biology, but without the cost of, need, of needing a lot of labeled training data? So to address this question, we started looking at recent insights in what is called self-supervised learning. So self-supervised learning trains neural networks from puzzles 
where twenty neighbors to be defined are not automatically without human intervention. Um, so one great example of a self-supervised learning method is, oops, is shown here. And um, it asks the model to predict how much an image has been rotated by. So you can understand why this technique requires human in intervention, right? Taking an image and rotating it and recording how much it's been rotated is something that a computer can do by its own. So the model is trained to predict how much um, an image is rotated by. And something remarkable happens. So the feature representation that is known by the model seems to be almost as, seems to be very good at classifying objects in images, such as whether there is a car or a dog or an airplane in an image. And um, almost as good as if you had trained a model to directly predict um, what type of an object is in your image. So why does this happen? I thought the task is simple. Um, um, it requires an understanding of the natural world. So for example, you can see for this image here, you can obviously tell that it's been flipped upside down, right? And that's because that you can see that there are people in those, this image, and those people have been flipped upside down. But that requires understanding what people are and how they are naturally oriented, right? Um, so the model needs to develop that understanding to really be able to become effective at solving this task. And that is why the representation seems to be very good at representing natural objects in the world then. So we were very inspired by, by that method, but we couldn't use it out of the box. My cross the images are rotation invariant, right? So instead, what we decided to do is, is that we came up with our own self supervised task, which we call parasolian painting. So these are human cells. And so for many images, you, you image the same protein as expressed in genetically identical cells under the same condition. So usually, not always, but enough of the time that it is an okay section, the cells will have similar protein expression and localization. So what we do then is, is that we're going to take one cell from the image, and we're going to show this to the model. And then we'll take another cell from the image, and then we'll show that to the model, but we're only going to show the model the shape of the cell. So show, the shape of the cell is described by markers like DAPI or antibodies for tubulin or something like that, okay? So we're going to ask the model to predict, to create an image of what it thinks protein expression looks like in the second cell under the assumption that both cells have a, have a similar level of protein expression. So the reason why we expect the model to learn about protein biology, I think, can be explained best from a human perspective. Suppose that I gave you these two images and I asked you to draw an image like this. Yeah. Um, so you look at this image and you go, okay, this protein is localized to the nucleus of a cell, so I need to draw a bunch of green dots inside of the nucleus of a cell. But that requires looking at this image and understanding the protein biology in this image, so we, we expect that our model will have to develop a similar sort of understanding that way. Um, so here's how it works in practice. So the two cells are shown to the model as independent branches of the neural network and the neural network is asked to create this image. And it's compared to the real image of protein expression for the target cell, and this repeats over and over again until the model converges. After it's trained, we're going to use the part of the um, network that is used to extract information from the source cell, and then we'll distract, we'll discard the rest of the network, and now the, what is called the source cell encoder is used to extract the feature representation of protein biology from each single cell. So that's the method. And now I want to show you how it actually works for learning representations of protein biology. So the first set set we decided to start off with is something called the second set set. And the major aim of the set set is to label protein by the perceptual localization. So whether it localizes to the nucleus or the mitochondria or any of these 17 classes um, for yeast biology. So to assist um, people in the development of automated methods, the curators have created, curator created a nice set of over 30,000 um, labeled single cells for 17 different classes. So the idea then is, is that we can use this label data to benchmark how good the representation is compared to other methods. So we trained an, an unsupervised method using one of the unlabeled experiments from the database, and then we extracted representations from the labeled data. And here are the accuracies for a k-nearest neighbor classifier using our feature representations compared to others. So you can see that our method significantly outperforms other methods on classifying protein localization in um, single yeast cells. So the computer methods include extensively engineered methods that have been designed specifically for this data set, as well as un other unsupervised deep learning methods. And remarkably, one of the things that you notice is that we come very close to the performance of a state of a supervised method, so a classifier on the data set, despite not using any labels for protein biology. So the next thing we wanted to assess then is, well, how general is this method? So remember, I, my goal is to solve this problem where we have this bottleneck, right? 
so in order to do that, a method needs to work on any arbitrary data set out here. So we took two data, high throughput data sets that are very different from the data set I showed you previously, the central data set. So one of these data sets is imagery in bright field, and then the other image one uses an, an unusual nuclear core marker, okay? So one thing to note about these data sets is that they have never been analyzed automatically before, only through labor's manual inspection of tens of thousands of images. So their properties, and I think this contributes to the reason why they've never been analyzed before, but they have properties that make automated analysis challenging for traditional methods. So there are a lot of overlapping and other focused cells in the set of set, and there's no set of present marker for the set of set, which is required for many types of engineering features, okay? Um, so here are what the representations learn for each set of set um, for our method. So I've reduced them using UMAP and I've colored them by previous manual labels for protein localization. Um, and um, for all three data sets, what can, you can see is that distinct protein localizations are well separated. And the separation for the two new data sets seems to be a, about as good as the one for the data set that I've shown you previously, which have shown that our features are very good for and seem to outperform other methods for, okay? So the key takeaways are, are that paired cell and result, results in performance gains for biological analysis on real study data sets. And um, it seems to learn the similar discriminative representations for data sets that are less amenable for automated analysis. And then hopefully, I hope I've, I've convinced you of the performance and the generality of the method, because the next thing I want to go on to show you is, is that I want to show you what are some of the applications of a method. Then. Okay, so here are this, here, these are representations for human proteins that we extracted and um, trained using the human protein atlas. So in total, you can see that there are about 4,000 different proteins inside of this clustered heat map. Um, so we've clustered them here, and what that does is, is that it groups together proteins with similar representations. So when we look at the proteins that are clustered together, we're expected, um, we see that there are very strong enrichments for um, gold annotations, for cellular annot components within each cluster. So one of the things that we are able to do with this clustering solution is, is that now we can ask um, what proteins, we can query proteins of interest to discover what proteins are similar to that protein, okay? So we can, we can understand and we can find more examples of proteins with, for example, very rare properties. So one example of this is that um, these are proteins that localize to the nucleolar rim. So you can look at this, it's a rim, it's a rim around the nucleolar cell itself. And the human protein addicts originally only documented one example of this kind of protein, which is shown here, and CO. So one of the things that we wanted to do is that we, could, we wanted to see if we could find more examples of this very type, a real type of localization pattern. So we found within the 30 closest proteins, there were 13 other new nuclear rim proteins, um, some of which were shown here. So we actually included a list of the nuclear rim proteins that we found in the preprint. And what we see is really exciting is, is that it actually seems to have led to some real biological hypothesis up here. So after we, we posted the preprint, we were contacted by a group that was studying one of the genes within the list that we published. And they said that the nuclear rim localization of of that protein was something that we did not know about before. So apparently, for other proteins within the list, for that localized nuclear rim, it acts as a storage mechanism for the protein until it is required for differentiation. So they ended up hypothesizing that their protein might be regulated in the same way. So this is another behavior that we were not previously aware of, but emerged from our data exploration. And hopefully that shows you how representations can be used to discover interesting new biological hypotheses then. So the next example of an analysis that is possible with representation has to deal with multi-localizing proteins. So um, these are proteins that are present in more than one um, compartment, and constriction factors are the canonical examples. So they're active in the, in the nucleus, and they're stored elsewhere when they're not being used, right? So one of the things that um, I'm really interested in is, is, is that it seems that the proportion that a protein is distributed between its compartments might be a nuanced way for a cell to encode signals and then control its regulation, right? It seems like the protein will do something different if it's 90 to 10% between its compartments versus like 10 to 90%, right? So I wanted to quantify this. So um, I wanted to quantify the degree to which a multi-localizing protein is present between compartments. So here's how it works then. So suppose that we have some cells that we know localize poly to the nucleus, and then some cells that we know localize poly to the cytoplasm. And um, we can average these cells together to get 
two points in the representation space that represents the average, average of, the, of all of those two types of cells, okay? So then given a new cell um, that we think localizes to both compartments, what we can do then is, is that we can measure the distance of that new cell to each of um, our two ports. So we have a straw then that is the log of a ratio of these differences and the way the straw behaves is, is that when the cell is about equal distance from the both, both points, the straw will be close to zero. When it's closer to the nucleus point, then the cytoplasm point will be um, positive. And when it's closer to the cytoplasmic point, it's going to be more um, negative. So the idea is, is that we want to explore how the score can help us quantify multi-localizing proteins. So we expect the score to study every protein annotated as cytosol nucleoplasm or cytosol nucleoplasm inside of a human protein atom. And here are the distribution of scores for all single cells for each of these types, types of um, proteins shown as volume plots. And as expected, most cytoplasmic um, single cells have a very negative score. Most nucleoplasm um, single cells have a positive score. And then most of the multi-localizing single cells have a score in between. So if we look at a protein, multi-localizing protein that has, has mostly positive scores in its single cells, it's usually more nuclear. Whereas proteins with more um, negative scores tend to be more cytoplasmic. And proteins that are in between tend to have an even ratio between the two compartments, right? So one of the things that we decided to apply the score for was that we wanted to see if we could find um, proteins with single cell variability. So um, single cell variability has very important roles in cellular population. So these are uh, proteins that tend to be variable over the cell cycle, or they may be proteins that are different from cell to cell to help buffer the cell from certain types of stresses so that when um, a stress comes in, not all of the cells die out yet. So we thought we might be able to identify proteins with single cell variability by looking for proteins where the single cell has, single cells have a large spread of scores that kind of look like this, that they're evenly spread out through the entire um, score space then. And this is an example of how a protein with known single cell variability, you can see that some of the um, cells are nucleoplasm, others are localized to the cytosol, cell, um, are distributed within a space. So we looked at proteins that, that had a very high standard deviation of scores, and what we found was this is that within the top 10, although six were previously annotated, we were able to find four new ones that were not annotated to have variability, which I've shown here. And um, to me, to at least my eye, um, these were all examples where they had clear and ambiguous um, variability in their localization. So we were able to successfully discover new examples of proteins with um, variability in the score. And um, some of these proteins were actually very interesting, and these observations could serve as the basis for um, future analyses. So for example, NMI is interactive with some members of the MIC um, oncogenes, and it has high expression in certain types of um, myeloid leukemias. So I'm not an expert in here, so you guys are, but my hope is, is that um, these analyses open the conversation and pave the ways for um, hypothesis testing on the setup. Great. So in conclusion, I introduced a new set supervised method for learning representation for multi-channel micro microscopy images. Um, the, it, it seems to produce high quality representations for analysis of protein biology with no fishing engineering or manually annotated data sets. And then I showed you that the representation could be purposed for a variety of analysis ranging from classification to filter analysis to more specific questions. Great, so um, thank you so much to my lab for, help, for um, giving me very valuable feedback on this data, on this work. Couldn't have been possible without them. But also thank you to all the collaborators for providing the data sets for the study. So this is a lot, very, very large project that encompassed um, four different data sets, and you could not have done it without the help in accessing these data sets. Um, so finally, this paper is actually published. And if you're interested in it, you can check it out in Blood Computational Biology. Um, yeah, so that's all I have for you, but I'll be happy to take questions. Then.